Now, I have first to, to say it's this really a pleasure to moderate today this very important topic. It has a huge interest in Brussels community. It's now the most, int uh, the most uh, interesting uh, webinar we have. We have really over 80 registrations for this event. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it's a pleasure also to have Alex Agios Saliba, member of the European Parliament, and Hannah Wilkunen, also from the European Parliament, as host here today. I know you have really a tough timetable and uh, that we have now the time to discuss this with you is really uh, very uh, uh, pleasure mm. for us because it shows how you de dedicated to SME's needs. So I want not to take too much time and give pass over the opening and the then later the conclusion to Alex Agio Saliba, who was also the former or first rapporteur of the DSA and is our co-chair of our working group for platform economy. Please, the floor, the floor is yours. So thanks uh, again, Horst, and also SME Connect for organizing another event with regards to the Digital Services Act. Um, as, you, as you rightly pointed out, I think this is one of the most the hot, one of the hottest topics uh, being discussed at as we speak uh, within the European bubble, but not only within the European bubble. I believe that there is a very good um, discussion also being undertaken in different member states on the DSA, because here basically we are um, uh, laying down the rules for the future of the internet. So it's 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 something which. Um, touches upon uh, the very fundamental uh, interests of both our citizens, users, and also of our companies. So it's really important also to discuss the Digital Services Act from the perspective also of our SMEs. Basically, here we are dealing and we are discussing the Commission's uh, proposals on the DSA and DMA, which were published on 15 December of last year. Um, the draft DSA basically aims to set enforceable, enforceable rules and standards for online intermediary services, which basically have become the new public utilities of our times. Platforms such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, and also Booking.com, but also other companies which play the role of uh, cloud service providers such as Amazon and Dropbox and also Telecom. Uh, providers such as Telefonica and also Proximus. Basically, the DSA proposal seeks to amend the 2000 e-commerce directive, um, basically by proposing additional obligations for intermediary service providers and also reinforced implementation, coordination, and also enforcement rules, which are so much needed in this day and age. The Digital Services Act proposal also seeks to modernize the rules governing online platforms dealing with content moderation. During the past year, we have seen a number of, of, of instances where also the, the issue of content moderation and the decisions that are being taken in the background were heavily questioned, especially after the um, US Capitol Hill riots that the political visibility of content moderation basically became more visible, although I believe that it was always visible, this discussion. But um, as I said, the DSA will also touch upon content moderation when it comes to specifically the notice and action uh, mechanism. This proposal was also long awaited because it is moving forward a set of new rules that shall transform the digital services and also markets in the EU uh, and also potentially beyond um, the EU. And I think this is one of the biggest ambitions of our legislators to have a system um, like we had when it came to the uh, when it came to the general data protection regulation whereby our rules did not only affect our continent, but basically uh, our values were also taken much further away from, from the European continent. The proposal um, can be seen positively as it is updating the 20-year-old legal framework set out in the e-commerce directive and also modernizing the rules, the definitions that uh, ultimately 
we had to be very creative during the past years to try to align with the new realities that basically we were facing in the digital ecosystem. And therefore, I think this would be also a very good exercise to have more clarity, more certainty uh, in this area, both for users, but also for the, for the players. There is no doubt that when adopted, the DSA will definitely be a game changer for Europe and also for the rest of the world. Online platforms, as I said, have become indispensable in our lives. However, they have also acquired unprecedented powers by becoming basically the rule setters in their rights, creating a digital environment suited basically for their, for their vested interests. And therefore, big digital companies have used their powers to survey users, decide what we can see, what we can read, and also what we can see and buy online, therefore affecting directly um, our SMEs. Consumers have been exposed to online scams, to faulty products with no legal protection online whatsoever. And I am glad that the Commission looked seriously into this, these problems to onboard also um, the legislative initiative proposals that we have moved forward last year, so that basically we won't end up in the situation that we are in today of having two sets of rights when it comes to consumers, a set of rights for consumers when they are basically functioning uh, offline and an inferior set of rights that we have today for consumers when they buy and purchase services and goods offline. Although much of the legislation will significantly change also the user experience uh, of everyone, those who are using these networks to buy goods and services online, including SMEs in the digital market, the discussion about outstanding issues is still very alive and it's picking up not only in the EP, but as I said, also in our member states and also within the stakeholders. Therefore, I am glad that we are hosting this timely debate two weeks before the deadline of amendments uh, for, the, for the DSA, whereby we will be seeing a number of compromises taking shape for the, for the DSA. Therefore, I am all yes and waiting eagerly to hear directly from the stakeholders uh, in, the, in this field. Again, thanks a lot, Host. Thanks a lot, SME Connect, again, for this uh, initiative. Thank you, Alex, for this perfect overview. I think you mentioned SMEs, consumer protection, fundamental rights, and in the end, it's about trust and fairness. Thank you very much also always that you don't forget, and I think this is also for our next speaker, very important, our SMEs. The keynote is now by Hannah Wirkunen, member of the European Parliament, member of ITRE, AIDA, special committee, co-chair of the SME Circle in the European Parliament, and ITRE Shadow Rapporteur on the DSA and our second core chair of the SME Connect Working Group Platform Economy. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Horst, and thank you for my co-chair, Alex, for his opening remarks. Uh, I don't know how much I have uh, to add to this because Alex was already, I think, uh, presenting the main, main points of this regulation. I'm really a rapporteur in, in each committee, not shadow, but rapporteur uh, in this important uh, regulation. And to, tomorrow we will have the discussion in each committee about the report and we have to table our amendments in next week and in IMCO committee is also the members are also working now very closely with their amendments. So I think the uh, timing for this discussion is just perfect. And just like Alex already said, we are very willing to hear stakeholders views on this important regulation, because we know that this uh, Digital Services Act, it regulates digital services uh, that act as uh, intermediaries uh, that connecting consumers and goods, services and content. And in our digitized society, the scope of the regulation, of course, it's huge. It applies to large social media platforms 
and small online stores and everything in between. So I think now uh, often the public discussion is focusing quite much to these social media platforms and to those big players. But we have to remember all the time that this uh, regulation will have impacts to whole ecosystem and for the, all SMEs also. And that is now what we have to, I think, look very carefully when we are setting rules. The aim of this uh, DSA is to give better protection to consumers and to fundamental rights online, establish a powerful transparency and accountability framework for online platforms and lead to fairer and more open digital markets. And I think these all are very important goals. It's because uh, we know how big part of these online platforms and the digital society is in our society. Of course, it's crucial that we have the same rules in online world, what we are having in, in our societies and in our offline world. And that is one of the main principles in, in this regulation that we should have the same rules in offline and online world. And I think it's important goal. One of the key aims of the regulation is also to avoid fragmentation in the international, uh, internal market. Uh, the DSA will make it easier to provide digital innovations across borders and avoid diversing national approaches. This is extremely important aspect of the DSA. We know how difficult it is for our SMEs and for our digital industry if we have uh, 27 different uh, regulations in the European markets. And during the last years, we have been working very much to, to remove the barriers and uh, to create one digital single market. But often it happens that if we are not moving fast enough on the European level, then often the member states, they start to take their own actions. And uh, this is now what we are trying to avoid, that we're trying to work for that, that we should have one one regulation, which is common regulation, and we have to safeguard our digital single markets. Because uh, if we want to boost our digital economy, and if we want to boost our startups and uh, make sure that they can also scale up their businesses in Europe, it's crucial that we have one, one market here and not 27 different rules. As the ITRA rapporteur, my focus is ensuring the necessary legal certainty and small and micro enterprises. Like I said already, uh, the public discussion is quite much focusing on those big players in these digital markets, but we have to remember that there is thousands and thousands uh, small and micro enterprises in European markets, and we have to also uh, in, uh, um, encourage them to also grow and invest in, in Europe, and we have to make sure that this is uh, innovative and uh, uh, and uh, interesting markets for them also in the future. Because uh, I'm working in ITRA committee as a rapporteur there. Uh, ITRA committee is very much the committee of SMEs, industry and innovations in the European par Parliament. And this will be also uh, the points to where I will focus uh, as a rapporteur. I think it's important for European businesses, especially for SMEs, that companies based in the third countries, but operating in the internal market, follow the same rules as European companies. And I think this has become more and more important now during the pandemic, because we have seen how much e-commerce has been increasing and all the digitalization has, it has get uh, also a big boost during the pandemic. And uh, it's more and more important now that we make sure that all the companies who are coming from the third countries, who are operating in European Union, they have to respect our rules because otherwise it's not fair for our companies. So creating a level playing field and fair competition, it's one of the most important uh, think, points in this regulation. This approach has been also included in the commission proposal, and it is important to maintain it also in the final text, while also ensuring efficient enforcement of these provisions. I think it's also important that the administrative burden we set in this regulation does not go beyond what is strictly necessary. And as I mentioned already, ITRA committee will focus very much to the role of SMEs and what kind of impacts this regulation will have to our SMEs. 
And uh, in the same time, we know that commission has committed itself to one in one out principle. And they are committed to that, that we will have better regulation in the future. And we are also avoiding regulatory burden for our SMEs. And of course, now we have to look also when we are setting the new rules to digital markets, that what does it mean for our SMEs and especially for our small uh, enterprises, micro and small enterprises, because they don't have the same resource, resources to work with all the bureaucracy, what it often means when we are setting new regulations. So I think now when we are going all the articles uh, um, True, we have to really look at is there something where we could be more flexible uh, when we think about our uh, micro and small enterprises, because all the time we have to avoid extra regulatory burden. I think it's very important that we have that kind of regulation that encourages innovations and jobs and growth and not too much bureaucracy. In many parts of the regulation, we need to strike the right balance between different legitimate interests and arguments. We need to avoid over removals of content, but ensure at the same time that the rights are protected also online. We need to provide consumers with transparency and safeguards, but ensure that the freedom to do business and avoid overly descriptive and detailed provisions. We need to ensure the necessary legal certainty, but also allow for flexibility through interpretation and delegated acts to make sure our regulation is future-proof and relevant when the technologies evolve. And this is, I think, always very challenging when we are speaking about digital uh, regulations and also um, when we are making decisions, because we know that in the European level, the decision making process is very, very slow. It often takes years, but all these technologies, they are developing very, very fast. So we have to have really future oriented and future proof legislation also, because we have to boost innovations. We shouldn't set obstacles for the new ideas. After very carefully analyzing the commission's proposal, I have uh, for my part found that in many of these cases, the choices, uh, made by the Commission in their proposal have been justified and well reasoned. But of course, there is room for improvement. But the starting point is, I think, a very good one. And that is also the feedback I have mostly got from our stakeholders that uh, I think uh, the general overview on this regulation has been quite positive. But of course, there is many, many different articles and details where we have to improve them. And uh, that's why I'm very happy that we have this opportunity today to, to listen your thoughts uh, and ideas, because like Alex said, uh, during the next uh, days and weeks, uh, we will prepare our own amendments uh, in the parliament and I think it's very important that we are now listening to the stakeholders and, and your views and really we have to focus I think very much to our SMEs and for our micro and small enterprises because we want to really encourage them also to grow and do business in Europe and this should be that kind of market that really gives inspiration and um, ideas for the whole world. So thank you very much for having this opportunity to take part of this seminar, and I'm very willing to hear the next speakers. Thank you very much that you gave us as a rapporteur the, 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 the main points, uh, focus that or the balancing uh, impression of that we need to, to protect consumers, but we have to focus also to jobs and grow that SMEs can, can also have a uh, uh, an environment where we as Europeans are not only regulating, but also giving the chance to, to use this innovation, to use these new markets. I think this is very important but because in the end, consumers want to have competition, fair competition. Uh, SMEs are related with trust and consumers buying there where they can trust. And I think it's also for our society important that it's accepted the new digitalization and then we need clear rule, I think. And it's important what you say, not to overdo it, not to have too much bureaucracy, because this is a huge hurdle for SMEs. Big companies can 
handle it, but SMEs, this is then an act if it's really something where you have to, to put your resources in, in such stuff. I think you are in the right way with, with your, your approach, but now we want to hear if you, our speakers for the remarks I agree with you or they have comments. And we're starting, in fact, to hear, and this is very interesting for us, uh, what's going on in the council, what is the position of the permanent representation of Poland to the EU. We have the honor to have here on board Justina Romanowska, Conciliere for Telecom and Information. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Horst. Good afternoon um, to everyone, to the organizers, the panelists. Um, and uh, the participants. Um, thank you for the invitation, first of all. It's really uh, great timing, I must say, because nothing is set in stone yet. The positions of, of, of both institutions are, are being shaped uh, and it's a great opportunity to discuss uh, this very broad uh, piece of legislation um, which demands a lot of work, I think, still uh, from all of us. Um, and it's very interesting uh, to have the opportunity to listen to all the thoughts and ideas that are, are going around uh, this file, uh, because as it was mentioned by the speakers before, um, the, the proposal looks good. And, and this is the general perception that the commission uh, was able to present um, a good substantive proposal, uh, which uh, not everyone is, is very happy about, but um, uh, it's, it's reason to justify it uh, and, and a solid impact assessment is there, uh, something that uh, we had to go through um, in the council during our working parties, but it was really, um, um, I think, needed to understand properly uh, the, the, the proposals uh, and to, to make sure that we are not over-regulating. Uh, so maybe starting from, uh, from, from uh, more general remarks. Indeed, I'm the attache for telecommunications and information society, and I, I have a pleasure to negotiate the fight, which is not the obvious setting in, in, in all member states, because the file is dedicated to the Compact Council. Uh, so we are joining the, these working parties, and uh, I think it was already over 20 of them organized uh, by uh, Portuguese presidency and even by German presidency um, at the very beginning. So uh, we, we spent already and dedicated um, a lot of time to go uh, through uh, this file, and we, uh, let me say, we cut the elephant into slices which was really, uh, really something, I must say. Uh, and I'm glad to hear uh, uh, Madame Rapporteur and uh, also uh, Mr. Saliba that the parliament is, is also on the right track uh, and in the right pace um, and dedicates a lot of energy uh, to, this, um, to these discussions. Um, to be understood uh, properly, I'm not uh, presenting the council position today. Of course, I'm just a member state uh, sitting around the table and contributing to the discussion. Uh, so um, uh, maybe I will start a little bit from this, what is happening in the council, but this is all, of course the process driven by, uh, by the presidencies. Um, the Portuguese presidency uh, did tremendous job. Everything I think is, is, is transparent and, uh, and public. Uh, and um, the debate uh, of the ministers, compact ministers was also um, online. Um, it was May, uh, end of May uh, this year, uh, and the progress report was some kind of milestones for us uh, to really sum up this, this over 20 meetings uh, and to, to figure out a little bit where we stand and who is where, who's in favor of, of which parts of the legislation where we define the sticky points. Uh, so um, in this report, indeed, the presidency um, uh, dedicated a, a few pages to sum up the discussions, and obviously there, there, there is many of them, the, the sticky points, but I think the main ones, and everybody agrees with it, is, is, uh, is the scope, of course, which was already um, said today. The scope is very broad. Um, it, it's um, uh, um, entailing um, any kind of entities that are 
really uh, intermediaries, uh, and we have also caching and and um, and uh, there. Um, we have bigger players, which which are which are developed. We have small players as well. But um, the, the the other challenge I think there is it's also that in the scope we have social media and marketplaces, which by nature are not the same kind of services and not the same kind of um, players in the market. Uh, and we as users behave a little bit differently uh, as regards this, the services. So um, the scope is something definitely that has to be discussed in the council. The other part is the enforcement and enforceability of the whole uh, regulation, which is a horizontal piece of legislation, but on the other side, uh, there is many questions uh, and clarifications. I think still needed. Uh, what about Article One? Um, how do you say relates to other pieces of legislation uh, that already are in force? How not to duplicate the obligations? How to draw a line really for an entrepreneur? Uh, which ob obligations uh, are stemming from which file and which are uh, have priorities? In fact. Uh, so this is very, uh, very detailed and, and I think needed discussion. Mm, everybody wants, uh, everybody wants, of course, uh, harmonized rules. We want single market. We, we don't want the barriers. But this is uh, also a little bit legal talk that 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 we have to do here. Uh, another important part um, mentioned in this progress report was content moderation and how to deal with the with the rules there. Uh, and, um, and and many other topics um, uh, which uh, which differ depending from from a member state to member state. Um, I would I would say that one of them, for example, is is the potential extension of the status of, of trusted flaggers, which is a very detailed uh, issue. But we have to also uh, take it into account or. Uh, when um, and how much time member states, for example, need uh, to implement um, the regulation to make it operational, uh, what kind of steps needs to be taken by us as member states, because we have to draw, we have to draft, in fact, uh, for certain provisions, we have to draft our national laws. It's true that it's a regulation, but not everything is there. Uh, and uh, and that's why uh, creating also new institutions, dedicating new powers to digital service coordinators, to build the board, uh, to, to, to make all the system working, it also requires some energy time. Uh, and, and this is also our perspective that I think, you know, it's unique for member states because we are the ones who, who have to uh, who have to take care of it. Mm, so this is this is a uh, very brief uh, mm, uh, maybe run <laughs> through the the progress report and uh, nowadays it's it's the end of, of the Portuguese presidency but the colleagues are still dedicated to to, to work on this piece of, of legislation we are we, we we have a pleasure really to to work on the pieces of compromise first compromise draft uh, and it's still work in progress uh, so um, before summer and, and surely after summertime, um, Slovenian presidency will have uh, you know full hands of work uh, with us and with this file, um, and 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 hopefully we will deliver uh, the general approach to be able to to, to move further. Uh, from our end as Poland, maybe I will just share with you a few words uh, where we stand on this, uh, what are our drivers in this file, because. Um, this is a step in, in the right direction. This is something what we were also expecting. As you meant at the beginning, Horst, 20 years, you know, it's, it's a piece of time. Uh, and, and we have to modernize the rule. we have rules. We have to update them. We want to keep the principles there. Uh, and, um, and we also have to deal with the question, um, how very large online platforms, which are somehow in the heart of this, of this regulation, uh, should be uh, um, what we expect from them, uh, what kind of obligations we see there, but how not to hamper uh, these uh, benefits and this good development that we have already in our European market, uh, because we don't have any vlog yet here. So we have to be very, very uh, careful on that. Um, so from, from the Polish side, definitely this is 
a very important uh, part, important articles. So we will focus on very large online platforms, but we don't want to forget uh, that the proportionality is needed. And this is something what we will really call for. There are some justified cases and, and we, we're gonna discuss it for sure in the council that there might be some obligations driven by the security reasons or other reasons uh, to be put on everyone. But from our end, this is what you can expect is, is definitely to take care of, 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 of this piece um, of legislation and to keep the proportions there. Uh, and our um, another uh, element that, that we bring to the table is, is the question um, and the need to empower uh, the end users. Uh, how we should construct uh, the transparency obligations, uh, the, mm, the, mm, the powers of the end users stemming from, um, uh, from uh, the voluntary rules, like, um, uh, like uh, the terms and conditions of the platform, but also how to empower them and to guarantee that they uh, claims, their requests are taken care of, that they are not served by artificial intelligence only, and that there is a human factor behind, that the decisions are not taken uh, by something which is not human overview in the end. So this is what we understand by the empowerment, and, and it, it, it's going um, gonna to drive our further discussions uh, in the council's, uh, council as well. Um, I don't know how much time I still have, but maybe I will try to sum up up. I think this was very interesting for us to hear this position. But uh, if you get too much information now, uh, summarize that we can come back to you. Otherwise, to, sure. to keep this in mind, to I think there will come questions up to you. I have already some. But if you summarize, this is super interesting. Um, please go on then. Okay, just, just maybe two, two sentences more. Uh, so um, the focus on blobs is, is, is something I already mentioned, uh, but paying attention to, to the innovative part, which are the, the, the small players, the discussion on the definition, who is SME in the context of, of the recommendation, which, which uh, the commission is, 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 is now taking care of, is also something that we have to deal with because the digital market is specific. Uh, so the, the, the range and the, um, the, the impact on the end users is also something, uh, something that we will look at. Uh, the innovation is still uh, the main driver here. And I think I will end up maybe my, my, uh, my intervention with, with saying that we totally agree with this very nice uh, phrase, catchy one, but a real one that we, will, we want um, to have the same rules offline and online, it doesn't matter. It's very true and real now in COVID times. It really doesn't matter because sometimes we are at the same time online and offline. Sometimes we are in the shop or in the office uh, or, or ordering some food by app. So it makes very, very good uh, uh, indication for us that the rules should be identical. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. I think also very interesting for us all to hear um, what you are, what the council, what the permanent representation are thinking about uh, the, this uh, regulation. I think this is um, to um, to say that the analog world should be or the digital world must, should be treated the same way like analog. I think this is makes sense, but. Uh, Harmonization is there very important. I think we learned from the past, from other regulations, if you have in the end the uh, 27 different interpretation, it is really also for, 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 the, um, for the citizens, also for SMEs, very difficult. I think this is very challenging. And I want not to speak too long that we have really a, a picture now, a landscape now of, of different input. Now we're going to Mike Sachs, uh, founder and chairman of the App Association. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Horst, and th thank you so much for um, inviting me to, to be here. Um, the App Association uh, represents app makers all over the world and all of, over Europe in every member state. Uh, app makers and SMEs are often talked about, but they're not always part of the conversation. So I am very happy and thankful to be here. 
I also want to especially thank uh, uh, MEP Ms. Furkunen and, and uh, MEP Saliba for being here and, and uh, having a conversation with the SMEs because uh, I think the perspective from these small companies is especially important. Um, our, our member companies, many of them are actually building their own platform. They're not only using platforms to you know, create their services on, but they're also a platform that enable other people and other companies to engage in, in commerce. Uh, they, a lot of them uh, are building apps that have user generated content. So this regulation is especially uh, relevant to them and it, it affects their ability to develop their company, to grow their company and to create jobs all across Europe. Um, the DSA is, is a good uh, thing for, for many of our members, I think, in general. Uh, you know, it's very good that we get clarification on, on the responsibilities for online platforms and other intermediary services and to get legal certainty because that legal certainty allows, gives us the stability to know what kind of investments we can make in developing products, but it also uh, motivates, you know, things like venture investments. And without that certainty, um, you know, investment kind of tends to freeze. So that, that is very important. So clarifying the obligations and the safeguards uh, with, with dealing uh, with illegal content is obviously crucial. And uh, as uh, Ms. Rikunen uh, has pointed out, having that harmonization uh, for the whole of Europe so that we don't have to deal with 27 different uh, sets of rules is especially important for the small companies. We just don't have the resources to even learn what the rules are, let alone um, implement each and every one of them. Um, we do have some concerns. Um, you know, if, if the DSA is not developed uh, thoughtfully, it could increase the administrative burden on small companies to the point that they are not even able to um, participate in the market. Um, that's true for European companies. It's also true for companies outside of Europe that are trying you know, to, to be active in the European market. And it could mean for European citizens that if those companies decide not to um, be active in Europe, that they you know, are uh, experiencing essentially what amounts to uh, um, a restriction of their fundamental freedoms of expression and, and right to, to information. Um, we think that the commission proposal uh, was a very good starting point and we really appreciate how the commission took the small and micro enterprises into account uh, when developing this proposal. Um, we think that as asymmetric regulation helps to ensure proportionality and the SME test keeps the costs from becoming uh, prohibitive for the small companies. We really appreciate that, um, you know, very small companies and micro enterprises are exempt from many of the larger um, obligations in the DSA. Uh, the proposal could still go somewhat further in establishing safeguards and reducing costs. But overall, I think the proposal was very well reasoned and, and a very positive um, first step. Regarding the IMCO report, we do have some more serious uh, concerns. Uh, we are very concerned that it, it appears that the lack of proportion, that, that proportionality is no longer um, considered uh, as important. Um, it seems to remove the exemptions for small and micro enterprises and as based on the assumption that the costs are negligible, but they, they are very substantial, especially uh, for small companies. Um, if you just look at the impact assessment from the commission itself um, with, for example, 50 takedown notices per year and having 5% of them uh, requiring a counter notice procedure, that would amount to a cost of 15,000 uh, euros uh, per year, which is, a substantial amount, and if those numbers are higher, you know, which for a company that has an app with a lot of users could very well be, um, it could go up to you know the millions of euros uh, every year. So there's not only the initial cost of establishing 
the mechanisms and the procedures for maintenance and reporting and dealing with these um, reports, but, but then also um, the ongoing expenses and, and the need to constantly adjust, especially if you have online content, it's very difficult to know um, what to expect. And if you have a very innovative product, like a lot of the small companies do, um, you don't have a lot of experience to know what what those uh, you know notices will will look like. So I I believe that the IMCO report kind of ignored the the considerable feedback that that the small companies either directly or, or through organizations um, uh, representing them gave uh, on on the DSA and draft and. Um, you know that it's really important to to consider what their ability to to deal with these obligations is is like in proportion. Um, now uh, we we do uh, believe that uh, there is some good news, especially the draft opinion uh, written uh, by Mr. Kunin um, is very positive. We really. Uh, appreciate that the, the SME uh, and micro enterprise viewpoint is taken into account um, and that uh, the transition, you know, from SME to hopefully becoming a growing enterprise uh, is also, uh, you know, made part of that. Um, so, so in conclusion, we, we think that uh, the, the uh, principle of proportionality is, is really crucial uh, to make sure that the DSA can foster a vibrant economy where all these uh, wonderful European startups can, can ultimately flourish. So thank you. Thank you very much that you brought a strong voice for our SMEs and startups. I think we heard it before also from Justina. Proportionality is a problem and, and, and it makes sense. It is always, can you say we can go down with the standards for certain stakeholders or we want to have 100 percent protection but the stakeholders not surviving with these business models anymore it is very a, a difficult questions where to find the pragmatic way to serve uh, the trust and security and the rights at the same time not to destroy jobs and, and businesses but this is also i think a fundamental um, uh, need for, for FE citizens. So um, we coming now to Fabian Fechner, Deputy Head of Brussels Office, Handelsverband Deutschland. Uh, I think you presenting or representing both sides, platforms and users and, and, and so. It is very interesting to hear your voice here and also from a German perspective. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yes, as you just mentioned, um, I'm representing the German Retail Federation or um, HDE, which is the abbreviation for Handelsverband Deutschland. And um, we are representing all kinds of uh, retail companies from Germany, and some of them are obviously also international, no matter their size, no matter what sector, so non food, food, um, and uh, also no matter the distribution channel, be it uh, brick and mortar, um, purely online or multi-channel and uh, a lot of our members um, are still in the process of going online and were actually forced to to go online to move online in the past uh, 16 18 months because there is no other way if you basically are confronted with a situation where the authorities close your shop down in the city center from one day to another because of COVID restrictions you have to survive somehow and the, the easiest way is to try to to still sell some products online and there within that online environment the easiest way the quickest way is actually to sell something via an online marketplace so this was a trend which was um, huge last year which accelerated um, a lot and which is very important in the context of this um, proposal so as you can already see, we are representing both sides, as Horst also said in this in this discussion, the platforms on the on the one side and the platform traders who are selling via these platforms on the other side. And um, we also have a lot of traditional retailers who are actually transforming into platforms, who are opening their online shops for third party traders. Um, 
a lot of them in the first step in the way of a closed platform. So you do not open it completely, but you allow a handful of selected uh, traders, which basically complement your offer. And um, for us, it's also very important to keep this model of closed platforms in mind when, when talking about the DSA, I might come back to this. But we are looking at the DSA, as you can imagine, from a purely retail perspective. So we are focusing a lot on online marketplaces. When we talk about platforms, it's um, basically online marketplaces. Uh, but we're fully aware, obviously, that the DSA has a very, very broad scope when it, um, when it comes to, to the different models of platforms. And that also already shows that we are very interested in a, in a balanced approach because of these two sides um, that, uh, that are represented in our association. The rules must work for both of them. That's why, like, a lot of other uh, previous speakers, we welcomed the commission proposal a lot, as, as Justina said. Um, um, it's, it's very balanced, or as Ms. Birkun said, the choices that the commission um, took were very reasoned and, and well justified in our opinion, especially because the commission proposal uphold, um, upholds the, the pillars of the digital single market and the main aspects of the former e-commerce directive, as well as this lowering, relative lowering of the burden for small and, and micro intermediaries, um, which, we, which we welcome um, explicitly, as well as the fact that it also has to apply to platform from third countries. This, this is a, a vital um, element for us because obviously for us, the reason to have this regulation is basically unfair competition from third country traders who do not play by the rules and um, yes, I think you can say that flood the European market with the uh, products that are not conform. We don't really like the definition of illegal content because it's very, very broad. We like to conform uh, to speak about non conform products, which are not in line with the EU rules, um, mainly with the EU rules on, um, on product safety. So we think it's very, very important to have this differentiated multi-layered approach in the, in the regulation um, that sets rules for all platforms, special rules that do not apply to micro and small, and then another set of rules for the very large online platforms. We, we think this, this layered catalog of uh, obligations is, is very proportionate, um, especially because you always have to, to remember that these rules apply to European companies at a very early stage, basically from day one, while non-European countries have the poss possibility to grow outside of Europe, be it in China or in the US, and then come to the European market when they are already big and, and have a lot of uh, users and, and, and sales. So if we really want to foster competition and bring up European platforms, as well as traders or let's say commercial users who use platforms, then we have to, to keep that in mind um, that um, we need to have a lighter regime for smaller players and to actually support them, them growing. Um, that's why, and um, I, I really like what, what Mike just said on that, we're also quite concerned with the IMCO draft report, especially with the changes on um, Article 22 and the new Article 5a, because um, as I said, the, the commission proposal was still trying to balance the interests of the involved parties. And I think with this, um, with this IMCO report, this, this is getting out of balance and makes it really, really difficult for traders to actually still be able to sell on platforms. Because I mean, so far this was kind of a comparatively low threshold model to sell products. Um, also because in the recent years, it has become much more difficult to open your own online shop because of a plethora of, of regulation, which also came from the EU level, be it the GDPR or the geoblocking regulation or the PSD2. So imagine you are put in this situation that your shop is closed down uh, last November in the middle of a, the pandemic and the lockdown, and now you, you need to survive and still sell some products. It's really difficult to build an online shop. It will cost you a lot of money. There's a lot of compliance involved um, to, to uh, be compliant with the data protection and consumer protection rules. But if you go to a marketplace, you get a one-stop shop, and at least for some time, that may help you um, survive. But if these platforms are made liable in a lot of cases for the products being sold and uh, need to check 
the traders much more rigorously and, and also the products that these traders offer, they will also increase the, the obstacles, the hurdles for the traders to actually sell on these um, platforms. They have no other choice in, in, in our opinion to pass some of that burden onto the traders, not to speak of costs that, um, that will increase. Um, and um, then these traders have to provide a lot more information about themselves, which is fine. So we think the KYBC rules in Article 22 as the commission proposed them are proportionate, but then um, uh, enlarging that to products as well and making the trader to provide a lot of information about the product, maybe even making the trader um, make these, these information also available in public, public databases so that the platform can compare um, is um, quite some, some effort. Um, yes, and, and as I said, uh, according to the input draft report, the platforms will be liable in a lot of cases. Um, for example, when there is um, a violation of, um, of certain articles within the, um, the DSA. So in addition to quite extensive turnover based penalties, you would also get um, liability. So you would not be covered by the liability exemption anymore in case you violate Article 14, for example, Article 22 and, and some, some other new, new articles. That obviously will lead to a situation where the platforms will be much more careful and to a situation which we can also call overblocking, which is usually um, a term used in, in the area of, of content, um, but not so much for products, but there will also be overblocking for traders um, and products because the platforms have to protect themselves and be 10%, 20% more careful than necessary, which will cause collateral damage. Already now, we have a lot of small traders who complain that their shops are closed on platforms, that their products are taken down in crucial times like Christmas. And the P2B regulation actually created rules for that when you, when you can do that also to protect these traders. But with the DSA that is not, not balanced and proportionate anymore, if, if it comes like that, um, the platforms would not have um, much other choice. So um, to, to conclude for us, it's very important to keep the exemption or in general, the multi-layered approach um, from the commission proposal um, and not get, get rid of it like it was proposed in the, in the IMCO report. And at the same time, pay attention to what actually you can put on a on the plate for the for the platforms in article 22 and also in, in 5 and 5a also there we thought like the, the commission had found um, a good um, balance um, but for us it's very important to always keep in mind that something um, you ask from the platforms might also have an effect on the traders that are selling via these platforms thank you Thank you very much. I think this was uh, also very good points here. Uh, it's to forget. It's often is forgotten that as uh, that big players are tools of SMEs, so they're using this for selling for to bring the services. Uh, I think what is interesting is if we are uh, that startups. If, if you want to, skip, uh, this was a very good point, and this leads then also to the next speaker. If I want to build up a startup and do this in the United States better than in Europe, and then come later to the market, if it would be easier. So this would be a wrong incentive. Also that that we have then by years that uh, that the big platforms are saying, okay, we are we make it easy. Often also GDPR we had this this phenomenon. We make it easy if you don't provide the startup or, or the right things, you're kicked out of of our platform. Uh, so that they make higher standards than, than they have to do. And also the, the, the last thing, if you, of course, investing in COVID, also especially in COVID times, but also in transition, in digitalization, we are rising the cost also for this, that many SMEs cannot uh, afford this longer. I think this was very good points. We're going now to our last remark, Manon Tapadzinski, Senior Policy Officer of Allied for Startups. Please, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Horst, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for inviting us here. We're really happy to be here. And thanks a lot also for all the other panelists for all the fruitful inputs. Uh, so for those who don't know us, Light for Startups, we are an umbrella organization of startup associations. We have 45 members across the globe. So we have members in Canada, such as Startup Canada, uh, France Digital, we have in France, or for example, Upgraded in Finland. 
And our mission as an organization is to make sure that startups they have the right regulatory framework that they need to scale and flourish. Um, and so when it comes to DSA, DSA is one of our priority uh, in terms of the certified this mandate. We actually organized last year our DSA for Startup Roadshow, which unfortunately we had to do virtually, uh, but we basically went to two different uh, ecosystem in Europe uh, with our members and some policymakers. And I think one of the key things that I wanted also to share also today and that came back from this uh, roadshow was that our members and startups entrepreneurs, what they want is clear, harmonized and proportionate rules when it comes to DSA. And they need it because it will encourage them to scale across Europe. And so I, I think I'm going to repeat myself. We were also really positive about the commission, the commission proposal. Uh, we were really happy to see that the key principle of the platform economy, such as the no general monitoring or the intermediary liability exemption was, were preserved. And here again, I think I'm going to, I will repeat whatever, whatever was shared also already, but we had, we do have three main concerns today that I would like to share with you, especially regarding the, the publica publication of the draft INCO report. So we have three concerns around uh, first uh, proportionality, liability, and then the country of origin. So on proportionality, what I would like to also um, say is that startups, they are consumer driven. They are, they are creating new services and product because uh, of, the, of an, a need from the consumer and they offer them new choices. And also when you are a startup and you're new in the market and that you're offering new, new services, you rely a lot on the trust of your consumers. So it's there in their interest to share the information and to provide the services that consumer needs. And so for us, it's important that when you think about all the, the total cost of compliance of the DSA, this is also taken into account and that the total cost of compliance doesn't end up as a market entry barrier for startups. And maybe if I can use an example of um, a startup <laughs> consumer focused. I, I don't know if you know Trustpilot, it's a startup that enable you as a consumer to review companies. And so they are really benefiting the consumers, but uh, they're not making profits yet. And so if we think about some of the, of the measure that we saw in the info draft report, such as the 24 hour deadline um, or the random checks, we are really wondering how this, the startups could, or any startups that is early stage in the process and entering a market, how can it be possible for them to implement this type of measures without maybe using monitoring tool and without going into the debates of monitoring tools, we know that there are also negative effects on the consumer, uh, uh, also consumer experience of any services. So for us, the proportionality part, as uh, Mike mentioned, and also Fabian mentioned, there it's really important for us that this is also kept in, in, the, in, in mind whenever um, GSA is discussed. We know that GSA is a real challenge as a legislation. It's a really big, big legislation. It's an horizontal one. Um, but we do believe that a one size fits all approach will not, will not be the, um, the, the best approach to, to deal, it, deal with it for startups. And actually, we were also really happy to see that in the each draft report, there were some amendments uh, for startups and SMEs. So this was our first concern. Um, our son, third, uh, second concern is around reliability. And I think as, as Fabian also mentioned, uh, in Article 5 and Article uh, 5A and Article uh, 22. It's interesting for us to see that the liability exemption regime is, um, is challenged for all providers and also challenged also more specifically for marketplaces. It's mostly interesting because it's not what the European Parliament agreed a year, uh, a year ago. So for us, the basis would be that um, uh, if you're liable, if you're aware of the legal content, that you don't remove it. But we don't think that liability, should, liability regime should be tied with the uh, other due diligence requirements or other obligations because it will not give the right incentive for startups. It will not give them the legal certainty they need whenever, whenever they start um, their business. And if I can also here give an example, for example, um, I'm thinking about Too Good To Go, which is a uh, Danish startups that uh, basically um, enable you to buy unfold food for either from either shops or restaurants, and this is not only giving maybe cheaper food for consumers, um, opportunity to buy cheaper food, but also it also uh, combating food waste. So it's a really good example of of our platform economy in Europe, 
And we're thinking that if the liability uh, exemption regime would be challenged or would be modified in the final DSA, this type of opportunities from, for EU consumers and for EU economy as a, as a whole will, not, will just not exist. Um, so liability, um, keeping the, the principle of the liability exemption regime from the e-commerce directive and how it was also suggested in the um, commission's proposal is really important for us. And then last but not least, um, the last concern that I wanted to mention today is the country of origin principle one. So for us, the basis is that platforms should only respond to the authority when they have their main place of establishment. Um, here again, it's a matter of legal certainty when you go cross border. And if I can also again mention a, an example, if we think about SoundCloud, which is already a new champion and is already offering a lot of services to consumer, SoundCloud is already dealing with a lot of illegal and harmful um, measures. And for example, implementing the Net DG law for some clouds make them triple their cost for their trust and safety team. So for example, for a startup like, um, like SunCloud, a DSA is really a good opportunity to harmonize all the measures around flagging and all the measures around noticing and um, mechanism um, measures. And uh, so this is an opportunity for them. But then at the same time, um, as an organization, as AFS, we are also concerned that if the enforcement is organized on the country of destination system, it would be really harder for some startups to just go to just go cross border. Um, so these are the three main points that I wanted to make. And just to conclude, I think what I wanted to share today is that we really believe that a flourishing platform economy will be one where startups and innovators in general can offer new choice to consumers. We are concerned that uh, the income draft report as it is now might not incentivize startups to grow um, their business in Europe. They might, it might also maybe strengthen the already established players and it might maybe in the long term prevent new EU champions to emerge. And for us, the objective of the DSA is to be proportionate and to work for all. Our members, they always tell us, look, we're not against, uh, we're not, we're not against any new legislation. We just want to be able to understand it and to comply from day one. That's the goal of our membership. And uh, this is why it's also our ask today to policymakers that the approach adopted on the DSA, the final one, would be one that is a tailored one and that takes into account all the providers and their resources. Um, thanks for listening to me. Uh, I'm happy to discuss and answer any question that you may have. Thank you very much for this very structured overview now of, of three points. Um, we want directly to go to the discussion uh, and uh, I have to say, Ms. Wilkunen has to leave a little bit earlier, but if we collect in the questions, so please send us the questions, we will send it to her. She will also have the record of this meeting. So um, if we're going back and if I'm summarizing this, the, the, the problematic uh, or the basic first, the commission proposal is good, but we have problems with the IMCO committee. And, and uh, like I hear it at the moment, it is not the opinion rapporteur in ITRE who is the problematic part of this. So Alex, um, uh, perhaps as IMCO a member, perhaps this is something we can address to you uh, because uh, it seems so that there are some, some uh, developments who could be a little bit um, complicated to find a compromise. What we would, what is your uh, feedback here, please? Horst, um, uh, when it comes to, and I have experience because I was the rapporteur before Crystal, um, when it comes to the IMCO um, opinion before the commission published its, its proposals, when it comes to such a complex task and such a very delicate balance that ultimately we have, you have to achieve as a rapporteur, I think it's not always a very easy task. Um, I can uh, totally understand Manon, for example, when she said that it's really important to basically create more certainty when it comes to the players. I think this is this came out very clearly from the discussions that I used to have with a number of stakeholders and that I am still having today. I don't think that stakeholders and players in the field are seeing the DSA as a threat to their business model, to their competition. But ultimately, I think that their biggest worry is the devil, which is in the detail. 
when it comes to the implementation, when it comes to overburdens that maybe the system can indirectly create. But I think that um, obviously as legislators, I think the most important thing that we have to keep in mind is first of all, to create more certainty for everyone, to users and also to players. That is our priority. To update um, our set of rules from no, at the notice and action system, which is still creating a lot of uncertainty and lack of action, which is finally taking, which is taking place because no one wants to carry the burden because when it comes to liability, clarity is missing, especially for a number of players. When it comes to advertising, when it comes to um, a number of other fields uh, in the in the in the DSA, but uh, at, at the same time, um, uh, I think that um, the, the 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 first draft report uh, in in IMCO was a good start. Obviously, there are there is room for improvement, uh, and that is why uh, we are. At this, at this, at this, at this juncture, preparing all the amendments and submitting all the different amendments to try to make the text more robust, uh, to make the text friendlier uh, for smaller players, because I think that one of the biggest issues and one of the trickiest um, parts of the DSA is our state of mind. Our state of mind is always to try to tackle the big problems. And the big problems and the biggest struggles, the majority of times are created by the biggest players. But then there are the smallest uh, players in the field. And ultimately, we have also to uh, juggle this balance and not only concentrate on what we want to do to tackle the biggest problems emanating from the biggest players, but ultimately how these solutions that we are creating will affect the smaller players. Therefore, it is really important to establish this uh, this balance. So this is the first draft. I think it's a good start, but obviously there is room for improvement. And definitely, I think that a number of compromises and a number of amendments will be submitted to make this text also friendlier um, and to create a more level playing field, because ultimately this was our aim as legislators to create a more competitive environment for our SMEs, for our industries, for smaller players who have to operate in a congested um, environment. Therefore, it is of utmost importance that these rules don't hinder competition, don't hinder the opportunities for our SMEs, for our smaller players. Thank you very much. I think this is very uh, uh, hopeful message because there is room for compromises and, 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 and for discussion still. And I think we learned this year also from your first report that this can become a very good end in, also in IMCO because there you have to balance always the interests of consumers and business, what is not easy. I know there are two, two strong, uh, strong um, positions. But I want only one question follow up by, by me. Uh, how we can take this into account that also SMEs using large platforms to sell the service and goods? Is this how we can make the, the, the point to say, yeah, we want to, to give uh, the, the, the responsibility to the big players because they have this, this market dominance, but at the same time, in the end, it's coming back, flashback to, to the to the SMEs? Is this how we can tackle this? I think it is already being tackled to a certain extent when it comes to the focus that um, the recommendations are taking place when it comes to the specific liability regime that we are creating for online marketplaces. But at the same time, when it comes to um, differentiation, when it comes to reporting, for example, when it comes to other obligations, um, and, the, and the wide set of array of different proposals that, 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 uh, that we have on the table, I think that it's really important not to overburden uh, the smaller players who may lack the resources to be able to comply with what can easily be complied with by um, big players uh, in the ecosystem. So I think this differentiation, which unfortunately cannot be achieved in all 
cases, but I believe that there are some specific instances and in specific articles whereby this differentiation can be made between bigger and smaller players so that we don't overburden um, our SMEs and smaller competitors by rules which are basically targeting um, the bigger the bigger players who are basically creating the bigger problems. And this is, I think, that the, the thing that we have to keep in mind that what can be easily complied with by big companies may be very burdensome, too burdensome um, for, for smaller players. And I think this is the biggest balancing act that the rapporteur and the shadows have to achieve uh, within, within the DSA process. Now, only a last thing before then I'm coming to Justina. Uh, I get a, a, a question from the Independent Retail Europe from Alex Varavka. And he says the DSA was conceived to tackle risk posed by open third party platforms, but overlooks the existence of other business models such as platforms run by cooperative retail groups exclusively for their own members established in the EU or closed platforms where only selected third parties can participate with their content consent subject to a legal conformity check before it is intermediated. Shouldn't these lower risk models be regulated more lightly than higher risk open third party platforms? Or in general, uh, are we, 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 we have need a model for different types of platforms and then to say, this is a lower risk platform, this is a higher risk platform, how to solve this? Can we make the exceptions? Is this a, a, a way we can discuss, Alex? Well, this yes, um, I think that we we can achieve this. As I said, it's it's sometimes it's tricky. Um, uh, I think that something else that we have to keep in mind is that we should and we must make this piece of legislation a future proof one. Um, it's important to define, but then to overdefine when it comes to very specific levels of intermediation, it can become um, very tricky or impossible to achieve. So uh, again, it's a balancing act that has to be done, but we have to be reasonable. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to achieve, but yes, there are um, instances where these differentiations when it comes to different levels of intermediation and specific, very specific business models or types of intermediation should be kept in mind. Thank you very much. And, and now, Christina, um, perhaps your fee first feedback about the, what we heard now from the speaker, from the stakeholders. Um, like you mentioned, uh, proportion, proportional, the key is very important, but also the harmonization is, 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 is something what is very, uh, was, was mentioned and um, that it must be uh, in, in a very practical way. Uh, if I see the analog world, what, it, what is the idea, what also Ms. Wilkunen said, analog world should be, what is regulated there should be also on digital be world regulated. But I think the analog world is not so regulated like the, the DSA has this approach. How to bring these worlds together if, if, if we have here different standards also in the analog world between the member states and then we have different standards again with a digital world who is even more connected than the analog world, please. Um, thank you, Horst. Uh, maybe I will start from that question and then I would like to comment uh, on, on something of, of course. as well. Uh, what about the harmonization and proportionality? I think due to the complexity of DSA, we have to um, uh, dismantle the file into specific modules, you know? This was very nicely said, I think, by, by one of the speakers, this multi-layer approach. There are so many layers. Uh, and uh, starting from the harmonization, um, the, tool, uh, the tool is... Um, is to harmonize via regulation the, the rules for liability and liability exemptions. So this is our understanding that due to lack of certainty on the market and there was a lot of um, jurisdiction, 
about it. The Commission is coming up with modernized rules based on the same three e-commerce principles. So that's easy part. <laughs> That's the easy part. The, the difficult part uh, for us uh, starts when we are talking about very concrete obligations for very concrete players. Uh, and I will maybe start from something more general that we have to look, look at. Uh, and I would like to also maybe the participants to, to reflect on um, how to scope uh, this, uh, this general provisions and then go deeper and deeper because now in chapter three, section three, we don't have um, SMEs. And in article three coming from the commission, article 13, sorry, coming from the commission, we don't have SMEs, but we have to start the discussion because there is a need obviously to do it. Uh, and the starting point for us is really who is this medium, small micro entrepreneur and and this is of, of course the legal talk but the definition who is who is in the recommendation coming from 2003 um uh, 361 uh, something that uh, is very uh, has very concrete metrics and is more dedicated to analog world because to define who is msme via i don't know the number of of uh, of employees uh, or simply the, the, the financial status is something more analog than digital, because in digital world, you can be in theory, you know, three people company uh, and have so many uh, users uh, and have a huge, uh, huge, huge, uh, much better such financial situation than, than the medium company. So uh, we are looking at it to really figure out, you know, what kind of metrics should be used there. And if it's, if it's, good reference to this recommendation because if we fix it we're gonna fix it for many many years so i i, I don't have a you know clear answer on that i'm just um trying to 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 do a little bit you know boost the discussion if you have it on your radar on your agenda to really look at it because it might be the case that we will somehow add there will be a need maybe to add some additional criterions to to see uh, that uh, to, to define who is really the micro uh, and, and small entrepreneur in terms of digital world. Uh, and then it will be still a little bit tricky, uh, tricky job to be done. Then uh, the proportionality is also linked with, with the specific obligations. And, and uh, I would like to take that approach that every time when we uh, when we discuss set of obligations, uh, we should really take this uh, zooming approach, you know, because uh, as it was mentioned here, um, the big players are, uh, are, are, are more obvious uh, case, uh, but we, we have to really reflect it um, in parallel. If we really want this specific article X, Y, Z to be dedicated for all uh, entities or for only some of them and why. And we cannot um, answer that question generally when we discuss certain chapters, certain rules, because on the, the discussing the rules is easy. But when we go into the nitty gritties, uh, we, we have to keep it in mind. So um, this is, um, it, it requires time and it requires really this kind of boring approach. <laughs> Uh, th th this very individualistic discussions, but I think only this way we will figure out how to get there, how to really build proportional set of obligations, how to not do it via certain blocks of or problems, because otherwise, you know, in, in one year time, we might wake up with a regulation which includes in many, many places, all the players, and we will certainly figure out that the costs are so huge of implementation that we are not in the place where we want it to be. Uh, and this is maybe my very general comment uh, uh, on, on the harmonization. Uh, I believe that, uh, that, that the, this is not the biggest concern maybe from the parliament side yet, but this is the concern uh, from member states, as I mentioned, how to, um, how to, to make these rules work and how not to duplicate because in certain aspects like for the marketplaces 
there are some rules offline and there are some rules online. They should be they should be very similar, but in our case, the consumer protection law, I bet it differs a little bit at least uh, from the consumer protection law in other member states. And our authorities who respond for the supervision or the of the products have certain rules of applications. They do it in a certain way. Uh, they do it, uh, of course, along the European rules, but the application probably is different. So it will be uh, uh, it will be. Um, a change, systemic change for them if we adopt DSA with, with the rules for uh, for illegal content, which means in fact the product. Uh, and we will have to um, face these rules with other sets of, of legislation, the consumer protection and other pieces, where in fact we have pro consumer or consumer agenda, even in the telecom <laughs> files even in, in all the digital files, there's always something about uh, providing information, transparency, um, a different kind of complaints. So uh, uh, we, we need very, at the same time, very general DSA, but also under these general provisions, we have to have a look who is the actor we want to put the obligation on and what kind of obligation in which situation and if, it, if it's implementable. I think yes, it makes absolutely sense. Otherwise, um, this the, what did the points you said. Also, the last with this difference about consumer protection in the analog world and then digital. Could it be a chance to to harmonize the digital world and then harmonize the analog world? That it's perhaps easier than to to, to adapt everything, or is there a conflict then? who is made in the contra uh, that perhaps if you have to a general approach and in the digital world. It is not fair against the analog world. I think how to to open the, the, this conflict really. I think this is super complicated. On the legal part, it's easy because we have Article One and without prejudice clause. And but the list is, I think, the longest ever. I haven't seen longer <laughs> so far uh, in other files. So the, the the question is very practical. You know, with, will this without prejudice make do the trick really? Uh, and if I may ju just quickly jump in um, to, to the closed platforms issue, because we, we also discussed it uh, some time ago when we when we dealt with terror content online uh, and, and um, the, the, the same kind of uh, struggles and challenges will, will, will be on our way here. But uh, in DSA and, and generally in the content moderation, the approach that, that we also support is that um, that the condition is that, that the content has to be displayed to the public. Mm -hmm. So it has to be publicly available. At this moment only, the rules kicks in. If, if it's not, uh, then it means uh, that, that the rules does not apply. However, there, there, there are also important aspects like you know how big the group should be, maybe the size of the group is already pub making it publicly available. So we will definitely come up come back again to this discussion uh, and I don't expect that we will copy paste uh, exactly the, the the solutions from terror content this was different story this was very um, different file with different um, different weight <laughs> yes from uh, from 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 that one so very brief comment on that uh, I don't know if it helps uh, or clarifies uh, somehow where we stand on this but I, I see that the border border in line there and we will definitely discuss it. Thank you very much. And now I want to give the chance, we're coming to the end, to, to the other speakers now to make comments. Mike, you wanted to say something? Please, the floor is yours. Sure, um, I, I uh, really um, was very interested in Justina's comments and uh, regarding the small companies and the differences between online and offline. If you look at a small company of three people, they wouldn't be able to, if they had physical goods, you know, produce that number of products um, to, to reach that, you know, millions or hundreds of thousands of people. A small company can do that, but so they have bigger reach, but at the same time, they do still have very small capabilities in being able to handle, you know, deal with complaints and, and, and uh, other things. Um, another difference with online, offline, is that you know? For example, if you are outside of the EU, 
to the point that Fabian made, um, these companies can grow their market locally and then come to the EU. Uh, if we require a legal representative, um, we might dissuade them you know, from coming to the EU. The cost by the commission estimated are you know, like 50,000 euros to have uh, true representation, uh, of legal representation uh, for the DSA. Um, so uh, if you are selling products, physical products into the EU, you generally don't need an actual legal representative. You might have a distributor or anything else. If you now for, for apps are going to require a legal representative that will make those companies outside of the EU uh, delay their entry in the market. And I think that's not very good for European consumers, but it's also not very good to not see what's happening, what other companies are doing in the world. If, if a company can grow, for example, in China in the local market to a very large size, we don't really as app makers see what they are doing and understand what they're doing. We will be blindsided by the point that they get, get big and they they enter the market. So so I think um, you know things like the legal representation for outside uh, Europe uh, companies is also something that we should we should look at uh, for an exemption. Um, you know for for SMEs and micro enterprises. Um, you know. Yeah, I think the global picture is in a global digital world always very important. Um, Manon, uh, what is now your reaction, what you heard also from, from Mr. Saliba, Alex and Justina? Do you have some comments to the end? Uh, yeah, just I just uh, first of all want to thank Justina also for, for her comments. Um, I think for us, it's really important and it's really, I'm really happy to hear today that also the, the council will also really go thoroughly through, through all the obligations and also see what could be potentially the cost of compliance for each of the obligations. And I just also maybe want to emphasize on the fact that from our perspective and from our membership, we don't, we don't think that one single provision is a problematic, but it's really the total cost of compliance. And I do agree also, also with what Mike just said regarding the legal representative for non-EU startups, because we also represent non-EU startup and it's something that we're also looking to at how much it could cost for small startups outside of the EU to be able to uh, pr uh, introduce or present, yeah, present or just have the possibility to have their services inside of the EU. Um, so I think I think that's it. Um, and I, I just want to comment uh, on the on the content and on the fact that um, when the, the rule should apply when the content is public, I think it's something where we would also need clarity of uh, whenever you are hosting or whenever you're not hosting and whenever you reach this goal of when is it when is it when is it that you become an online platform and that is public? Because uh, I think it's somewhat something also where we we would also be interested in having more clarity. Thank you very much, Fabian. Your last feedback to, to the, what we heard from, uh, from, from you, from, from the speakers, please. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to reply to two points that were mentioned. First of all, the, the question of legal representative that, that Mike brought up. In, in the area of online sales and products, we are actually a supporter of a concept where everybody who sells a product has to have a responsible economic actor within the European Union. But this is not for the DSA to regulate because this is already in the market surveillance regulation for most products and can be dealt with in the upcoming revision of the um, general product safety um, directive. And um, this, this also shows a bit that there is, in, in my opinion, some kind of misconception what the DSA is actually for because we have other examples um, also from the IMCO draft report um, about regulating terms and conditions, for example, and information obligations about sustainability um, information. Uh, these are maybe valid ideas, but there is an unfair, uh, um, uh, unfair contract terms directive and there is a, a huge proposal coming up uh, around Christmas on uh, the empowering the consumer for the green transition where sustainability information is much better placed than in the DSA. Um, maybe one can even like continue that list when it comes to, to advertising and algorithms. So one other message from my side would be let's focus on the on the main price here, not put too much things that are important to be discussed 
into the DSA, which is a piece of internal market regulation um, about intermediary liability um, at the end of the day. And then also um, referring shortly to the question by Alexis on the closed platforms. Um, obviously, when he talks to me, he's, he's preaching to the choir, but um, we, we also think that the obligations and requirements should not all, only be proportionate to the size, but also to the risk that is actually entailed. And when I have a closed platform where all the traders that, or the, the few traders that are selling on it are vetted very um, carefully, and even the products um, are, are checked, their quality checks before, the risk is a different one um, than having maybe a, a third country platform where everybody can sell and they are not um, uh, many checks. But this is also uh, a part of, of a bigger problem, and it was mentioned by, um, by Justina, when, when saying we shouldn't duplicate um, obligations and, and legislation, and also by Hannah Wilkner when she um, talked about um, the administrative burden shall not go beyond what is strictly necessary. The, the legal consistency is very, very important. And as I already mentioned, in when it comes to marketplaces, we already have the P2B regulation and a very new omnibus regulation in the area of consumer law, which introduced new obligations um, like um, out-of-court settlement, dispute settlement, transparency obligations that were just implemented by the online marketplaces. And now because the DSA has a bigger scope, introducing much more players, many more platforms to this, there is some overlap, which is quite, um, quite risky. And one really has to pay attention that there is um, legal consistency and legal certainty also when it comes to things like the definition of what is actually an active user, which is very important for, for platforms to know, are they actually in the category of a very large online platform or are they not? Because it says 45 million active users, but what is an active user on an online marketplace versus a social media platform? So we are making a proposal when it comes to online marketplaces, which is an active user, somebody who actually buys something um, how many times during a year there were still in the in the middle of the discussion, but there has to be a monetary transaction for somebody to be deemed an active user on, a, on an online marketplace and we have a and if we have a thorough definition of that in the DSA and the same one ideally in the DMA because they are, they are analog and um, then um, there is a bit more legal certainty also for the platforms to know whether they are a very large online platform or not. Thank you very much. It's a very important remarks. Also, at least DMA and DSA that they are not overlapping, but in general, I think it's a problematic thing. Justina, short, because we are in the end, your short last remark, and then we, can, we are closing this webinar. I think we have to discuss more, but the time is running, please. Very short remark, apart from saying big thank you for the invitation and this very interesting discussion. Uh, I'm really counting on follow up uh, with with you uh, and and with the, with the representatives of, of different stakeholders uh, because I as I said at the beginning this is the, the very good momentum we have still time to reflect uh, on on certain problems and we still have time to we are at the level of uh, shaping the philosophy of the file in the council. Um, of course, we're going to draft it, that, 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 that's for sure, and it will be done by, uh, by the incoming presidency, but I, I would love to use this month, uh, just you know, right now and after summer, to, to come up with, with good proposals. Of course, this is what I heard about IMCO report. I, I, I will have a look on it uh, after your grand, great examples that were given today, uh, and, um, and that's all, I think, uh, at this stage for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this was now a very good closing also, Justiana. Um, I have to say, uh, thank you very much for this for this very good discussion. I think also uh, we have to follow up. We have to use this time so we can all cooperate to bring the good messages and constructive messages to the decision makers. I think what is very important for me also in general, this is what Fabio mentioned also again, this this clear, this consistent legal system here in Europe, it's first, I think, not only helpful if we're discussing only one in, one out, if one in is super huge and covering everything what was coming out, then it's the same in the end. Second, SME's definition, I think this is uh, very problematic because we have a definition now in every regulation, we're creating new definitions 
perhaps we have to make a really modernized step. We did it last, last year, but we have really to do a modernized step for, for an SME definition who works in every time, way. And the last thing is, of course, uh, I think we have to not forget that we have always to balance it between the interests of protection, but also of chances. And I think we should often, I see the, the regulation of, of, of the European Union started first protection and not first innovation chances. I think we have to think also of the mindset is always good to think always negative and then positive, perhaps positive, and then say how we can it save this, this positive mindset. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, stay in touch.